Well, happy Saturday, everyone, and welcome to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, and I have Dave Denman filling in for Matt Allen, who's playing hooky today. And we are both here to help you with your car every Saturday from 11 to noon right here on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. We want to put you in the know when it comes to car stuff. All you got to do to get involved, and we hope you do it early in the show, is give us a call at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. Today on the Bumper to Bumper Road Map, should I be scared of automotive service coupons? Hmm, are those a good things? I'm not really decided. We're going to be taking your phone calls, and should I be responsible to pay for diagnostic? What do you think, Dave? Absolutely. Absolutely. It, absolutely. If you're looking for an accurate situation on your automobile, the guesswork's gone. 1980, it all changed. First computer went in a car. Well, when I called Dave on Wednesday as I was preparing for the show, I said, hey, what do you want to talk about? It's your show. What do you want to talk about? He said, I want to talk about technology. And the thing is, diagnostic is where the technology has changed. And we talk on the show about how the games have changed. So what your grandpa used to tell you about how to fix a car, it's not relevant anymore. Other than it still has a piston. Some of them don't have a piston in the engine. but uh, And they still have a lot of the same concept. But the game has changed, and it really comes to the diagnostic tools. Uh, when we plug into a car, we're talking to the car. We've talked in shows past about the programming of the car. See, the best way not to spend money uselessly on your car is to pay for diagnostic. Now, there are shops, good friends of mine, they do it this way. They'll check out the car, they'll diagno diagnose it, and when they call to sell the job to the customer, they say, well, you're going to need this, that, and the other. And they say, well, you weigh the diagnostic fee. So I'm going to say yes. I mean, you, it's a question you can certainly ask. But the one thing for the shops that are cutting edge and buying the technology to do a great job and honestly doing a great diagnostic where there is no guesswork they do need to be paid. It would be no different than going to a doctor's office and him saying, hmm, we need to take some x-rays to see what's going on. you got to pay for the x-rays. We can't skip them just because you get a cast. And so I don't want to, you know, I see so much angst for people over this, this diagnostic charge, and, and the, the tendency is not to want to pay it uh, because it feels frustrating. But the guys that are, that are hanging on and charging the bill a lot of times, yeah, they spend a lot of due diligence time to get it right for you the first time because you know you're going to hold us responsible for it so uh, it's worth paying am i am i wrong here dave i don't think so i think what what the the consumer uh, has to understand today that a professional organization that has dedicated itself to providing quality diagnostics and automotive repair with integrity and honesty uh, is making tremendous investments in in tooling technology uh, not only do you have to have a qualified technician that's committed himself to the industry through his training, his investment, and his tools, it's just like our facility has just made a purchase where we now have all original equipment, diagnostic equipment, and that, uh, through nine different manufacturers, is about a six-figure investment. But what it did show us was the pre-purchase uh, inspection we did on the BMW. Uh, the gentleman had been to several f facilities, tire facilities, this and that, tire pressure sensors on and uh, nobody could get it off, wanting to sell tire pressure sensors. And in reality, what was wrong with the car is BMW had issued a patch to the software system that uh, circumvented the short uh, in the software, which turned the light off. And all it was was just like you do on Microsoft. We have an update available. Click. Done deal. Solved. Well, when he came into the studio this morning, he had a big smile on his face, and he had this article that was written eight years ago, and it was written by, uh, there's a big uh, aftermarket parts industry group, which is going to include a lot of our vendors that we buy parts from, and they made a lot of predictions about where the industry is going, and I thought they were interesting. It was starting to become that 30% of their aftermarket parts were coming, were going to dealerships. So, uh, and that was one of the big changes. And one of the other points they made in there is that really only about half of the auto shops, independent auto shops, are computerized. And I don't know if I, how I would quite digest that, uh, but their big prediction was that uh, the future for independent repair was going to be working on the foreign cars, the Hondas, the Toyotas. And, the, and their point was that you have a lot more GM dealerships than you do Toyota dealerships. And so there's going to be more need for service outside of a dealership. Oh, that's absolutely true. Uh, the Asian manufacturers can do not have the service-based capacity to service the vehicles that they're selling. So what does that create for the consumer? 
They've got to find an independent repair facility that's qualified, that understands the technology and the design of the vehicle, and be able to deliver that to them. Right. So with the, with the technology, when you are working with an independent repair shop, and I don't, there's a lot of independents so that I would put absolutely against any dealership any of the week, day of the week. There's good dealerships doing good service. There's also good independents doing good service. The one thing that I like about the independents is that you're only a step away from the owner when there is an issue. It's not, you know, you got to talk to him, then you got to talk to him, then you got to talk to his manager, then you got to talk to his manager. All you want to do is get your car fixed. And you've got an issue and you've got a problem. The one thing I will pref- will favor on the independents, and I'm a little biased because I'm independent, and I don't want to not be not fair to the dealership guys because there's great guys in the dealership, but we like that local hometown feel where you can go talk to the owner any day you want. Well, let me give you an example of a vehicle without technology that an owner on site was able to solve for a consumer. He'd spent $1,500 getting his truck repaired, been back five times, frustrated, confused, had the vehicle towed to us, and finally said, don't even call me with a price. Just fix my truck. And reality was it, the repair was done improperly, diagnosed improperly, but yet every time this consumer tried to get back to get what was justly his, which was a car repaired properly, he met a wall because it was a club-owned organization that they couldn't find any management to solve the problem, and finally, he just surrendered. Well, we've got open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. And to our initial point about diagnostic, that's the, the one thing that auto shops, it's probably the hardest part of it, is the diagnostic. Because nuts and bolts are just nuts and bolts. Take one out, take another one out, take the water pump off, bolt it back in. That's just nuts and bolts. And a lot of people can do that, nuts and bolts. But when it actually comes out to accurately diagnosing the car, and this is my point, is, uh, and I just had this discussion with somebody the other day. They said, Dave, how much for a transmission on this particular car? And I said, what's wrong with it? They said, how much? This is, this is someone in my industry. And they said, what's wrong with it? And what he was describing to me did not fit needing another transmission. So I, I argued with him. He finally brought me the car. And when I got the car, he was so far off, he would have made a $3,500 mistake with a customer. So that's where the diagnostic is going to save you the most money, getting an accurate diagnostic. But when we come in with anxiety, I really don't want to pay for that. What kind of works on the psyche of the shop? Because we don't want to charge you for it either. We want to be everybody's friend. We want everybody to like us. So we don't want to have to charge you the diagnostic. It's no fun to charge people money. We don't want to be everybody's buddy. But in order to be financially responsible and to buy those tools and to be in business next year and the year after and all those things, we got to do it. So don't be afraid to pay for it. Oh, that's absolutely true. You know, you're either going to get a, a facility that will diagnose your problem or they'll do car repair by experimentation. I think this is wrong. Oh, no. Well, let's try this. Right. I think everyone's heard a horror story of that nature, Dave. We tried this, and we tried that, and we tried the other. Well, this guy, when he was calling me on the transmission, he said, he said, Dave, I don't, want, I don't want to charge this lady diagnostic. I've known her for years. She's going to fight me on it. you know." And that was his anxiety. He didn't want to charge her for that, but it was going to save her a lot of money in the long run. So we have to, we have to be disciplined. Hey, the other thing I want to mention uh, to people in our industry is coming up February 26th, the uh, Phoenix chapter of ASA, which is Automotive Service Association, we are having a shindig at uh, the golf course there in Tempe, and I'm drawing a blank on the name of it. We're going to be getting together. We're going to be talking about ASA. Uh, it's just uh, it's getting involved in your community and your local automotive association so we can bring up the standard uh, that we have going on there. And uh, anyway, when we come back, we're taking your calls at 602-277-5827. You are listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, and filling in for Matt Allen, who's playing hooky, is Dave Denman from Dave's Car Care at 51st Avenue in Peoria. And you guys have been out there for 33 years. A little different than when you started, huh? Uh, Completely. uh, First year that they put, like I said, Dave, the computer in the car, and, uh, you know, we've seen everything from the bulb removed to the tape over the check engine light. (laughs) Hey, you know what? We fix a lot of cars with tape over the check engine light. There's nothing to be frowned upon there. <laughs> so uh, I, I believe Matt is with his uh, his uh, group of guys that they talk about their shops and how they can do a better job. And I haven't even really talked to him to know the details. I think he's just he's sitting on his porch right now listening and laughing. 
<laughs> well, I think Matt's a little more involved down there in Tucson with his group. You know, no, learning to be a better operator. He is. I just like to tease him because when I was gone, he said I was recovering from a rather extensive back waxing, and I just thought that was inappropriate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so we've got Brian, Chris, Alan, and Mike. And up for this segment, we're going to go with Brian. It looks like he's got a 2013 Jeep Grand Cherokee. Go ahead, Brian. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, hi. I have a 2013 Jeep Grand Cherokee um, that's had various electrical issues since I've had it. It has less than 3,000 miles on it. Um, since I've had it, they've replaced the uh, battery alternator, uh, range motion transmission sensor. Um, and to make a long story short, what they found out the cause of all these problems were was a ground wire that was loose. Um, so my question is, what kind of other damage could have been done to the new vehicle with that ground wire not being properly secured or connected? I'm not, I'm not thinking we've got a bunch of damage, but uh, ground wire specifically probably more than likely referred to the computer getting good ground. The computer does a lot of signals based off of ground connection, and uh, mm-hmm. you know maybe the alternator, the, the computer will control the alternator, tell when to apply load, when not to apply load. They may have replaced a battery, thinking we had a battery issue. Uh, the range sensor on the side of the transmission uh, will act funky if it doesn't have good voltage or has bad ground. What's your thoughts, Dave? I would venture to say that uh, probably not one of those components was faulty, that the ground issue was the problem and that it took the technician the time to find it. Uh, there was missed signals going to those different components. We had the same situation the other day. Uh, Bad negative ba- battery cable. Everybody wanted to replace alternator, wanted to replace the voltage regulator and uh, battery. And uh, once we secured the cable, charged the system, everything was good to go. Well, I think this is a point of diagnostic, Brian, is that that really the diagnosis was bad ground. Bad ground maybe at the battery cable, bad ground for the computer. Caused them to replace an alternator that didn't need to be replaced. Caused them to replace a transmission range sensor that didn't need to be replaced. And all those pieces got replaced because of diagnostic. And the, and the one thing we got to clear up here for everybody is that we all assume that auto repair is easy. And it's not. It's tougher than it's ever been. Here you got a brand new vehicle. It's in the factory dealership with all the latest technology. And yet these guys were wrong on a couple of pieces. You know, And time will tell if the ground was really the fix, but you've got, you know, just right off the bat, the thing I think it has at least a three or thirty-six thousand mile warranty. I don't think any damage was done, so you don't need to. I would just put that out of your mind for sure. And uh, anyway, but to the point of diagnostic. Now, if you were paying for those repairs and they didn't fix it, and you had to go back, you would have said, "Well, did I really need the alternator? Well, did I really need the transmission range switch, and so on?" So, thanks for the call, Brian. Let's go with Chris. It looks like he's an AJ with an aftermarket scanner question. Go ahead, Chris. You are on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. I uh, guess I've been privileged. I was a uh, GM world-class master technician for 18 years with General Motors, and I got hooked on the tech, too. Uh, I've now moved into the independent world, and I'm trying to decide on a good aftermarket scanner that will do what I need it to do for bidirectional, all kinds of different things like that. What kind of suggestions do you have? Oh, man, you just hit on a topic that is a topic of every time you get five shop owners in a room, what'd you buy? What'd it do for you? Is it working? Do you like it? So, I mean, that's an ongoing question as far as what aftermarket scanners. I happen to own a Tech 2, and and Dave's over there putting his finger up. He's got some input. What do you got, Dave? Well, Chris, let me uh, just give you my experience. Okay. Um, Just recently, we went out and uh, tried to ask the same question to the industry that you're asking me today. Uh, Mark Warren, who happens to be the uh, lead trainer for WorldPack, has 65 instructors throughout U.S. and Canada. And I asked that same question to Mark Warren, and he said, in the reality of the new world today with the technology, you need to purchase factory OE diagnostic equipment. So for for uh, for Chris here, though, probably all around, if you're looking at a scanner, and I would say he's Dave's exactly right, is that you really need the OE scanner. So the one nice thing about the bumper to bumper radio network is I don't have to afford all the OE scanners. I just got to know guys like Dave and I can say, Hey Dave, uh, you think I can borrow that scanner? You just spent a bunch of money on and uh, Dave will gladly say yes. Right, Dave? Oh, absolutely. (laughs) For sure. But uh, we have a lot of my guys will have a snap on scanner 
That's uh, one of the parts companies, and and it's good at one kind of vehicle, not necessarily as good at the next, uh, but it just depends on what you're working at. So when we make a decision to purchase scanners, we look at how many times am I working on a Honda, how many times am I working on a Toyota, what does this one fit for this or that or, or whatever it may be. But, yeah, the bidirectional controls are a big deal. And for you people who are listening, you say, what the heck are bidirectional controls? Is that you can get a scanner that you plug into the car, and it's much like the one uh, at, the, at the Quickie Acme Auto Parts. They plug in, and it, it, it tells you some diagnostic trouble codes, but you cannot command the car to do anything. It's just reads. It's just a one-way communication. Bidirectional control is where we actually tell the car, all right, we think we got a throttle position sensor code or or something like that. We can actually go in and command something to happen, an electric motor to actuate, a solenoid to turn on. We're telling the car what to do versus the car just telling us what it thinks is going on. So that would probably be the best way as a consumer to understand. But good luck on that. That's the uh, million-dollar question is which scanner is best all around. So thanks, Chris. Let's go with uh, Alan on 04 Toyota uh, Sequoia. Go ahead, Alan. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, how you fellas doing? Good. 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 I have a 2004 Toyota Sequoia that I've owned since I purchased it new. And basically the first couple sets of brakes lasted me each about 55,000 miles. So I put a new set on at about 110. I'm at about 130,000 now, so 20 miles into the third set. Um, what I'm getting is every now and then I'll get a shimmy uh, when I hit the brakes. The dashboard lights up like a Christmas tree with the VSC control, the the track, the stabilization, the brake light comes on. If I turn the vehicle off and turn it back on, uh, those lights go away and the problem will go away. And I mean, I'd have the problem for another week, week and a half. And then I'll have it two days later. I took it in to one dealer. They said, the, it was the brakes that needed to be replaced. I just can't believe that after the first two sets lasted 55,000 miles, that the third set would only last about well, less than half of that. Um, have you guys ever experienced this kind of problem? And does the diagnosis sound correct that the brakes need to be replaced after, you know, 22,000 miles? Well, the, the pulsation issue, now when you've been doing the, the brake replacements at 55,000, 110,000, were you doing those or were the, were the rotors being machined at that point? Um. No, the, I was taking them to the dealer, and I think after the second one, the rotors were machined. Okay. So the rotors always need to be machined. That makes a significant difference. When you hit the brake and you get that pulsation, that is typical of a warped rotor, or we can have a hub bearing that's going bad can also cause a pulsation, uh, those type of things. When the vehicle stability light comes on, that's telling me, I mean, it's the check engine light, the vehicle stability light. All those things come on together, and it scares you. You're like, what the heck is going on? And then when you shut the key off, they may all go back out until the next time it sees the same issue. So the vehicle stability control, I think that's tied into the ABS. Am I not wrong, Dave? That's correct, but uh, I also wonder what quality of pad we're putting on that vehicle. That certainly certainly does make a difference is the quality of the pad. But uh, as far as those lights coming on, we could have a bad ABS sensor in those lights. So anyway, when we come back, we've got Mike and we've got Jeff and Georgina. So we're taking your calls at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, the automotive therapist, which we're still trying to decide what the heck an automotive therapist is. But uh, when you find out, just let me know. And uh, we're here along with Dave Denman filling in for Matt Allen. Dave is from Dave's Car Care at 51st Avenue in Peoria. They've been on that corner for 33 years. Uh, And Dave, I don't think he really remembers his first day in business, do you? Empty parking lot. (laughs) Well, he's been taking care of customers for 33 years. If you guys are on the west side and you don't have a relationship with a great shop and you need a relationship with a great shop, Dave's Car Care. And then the other thing, we talked about diagnostic early in the show, and we are going to preach this over and over and over again. The best way to lower anxiety is to have a relationship with a shop. You get to know them. You get to trust them. In a relationship, it's give and take, so no one is... You know, holding somebody, you know, holding their feet to fire. I'm going to make you do this right. You know, that creates a lot of anxiety for us, and that's not good for anybody. You're anxious. We're anxious. We just want to fix your car. Let's get a relationship going for years to come and not worry about all that anxiety. And do I pay for diagnostic? Don't I pay for diagnostic? If you're working with a good shop, they're going to be fair with you. 
You know, if they feel they got some value there, they're going to charge you for it. If they feel they don't, they're not going to charge you for it. So anyhow, uh, good shops can be found just like Dave's shop at BumperToBumperRadio.com. There's a contact link where you can email us on there. If you're looking for a recommendation, we'll make you a personal recommendation. We'll call them up. We'll say, hey, this guy's looking for a good shop and uh, introduce you. So up for this segment, we're going to go with Georgina. Looks like she's got a 1997 Mercury Villager. Go ahead. You are on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Thank you for taking my call. I have a 97 Mercury Villager, and in the past 10 months, we bought a brand new, but in the past 10 months, I've been sinking a lot of money into this. Right now, I think I have a transmission problem, and I heard your show talk about transmission, so I thought I'd call in. Uh, Did you want me to tell you my symptoms? Uh, Tell me how many miles you got on it, Georgina, and then tell me your symptoms. 217444. 217,444 miles? Yes. You're on the original transmission? Yes. You are living right, Georgina. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got going on? Well, the transmission right now, I think it's a transmission, but I'm not a mechanic. Uh, I've been to several mechanics, and I really don't like the way they've treated me, so I'm on my fourth mechanic. He seems to be okay. He's trying different things. But uh, the reason I think it's a transmission is because I will be driving along, and as I pick up speed, the car doesn't go to the next level. It's an it's a automatic uh, transmission, but it doesn't go to the next level smoothly. It jumps, it lurches forward, and if I give it too much gas to get it going, it, it jumps out. Now, it's already done that to me twice where it's jumped out, uh, out of the transmission, and the engine is good, everything is good, there's no light on, nothing's going on, but the car won't move anywhere if I give it gas. So it's done it to me twice, I had to be towed. What the mechanic told me, the recent mechanic I have told me was to try to ease up on it, which I'm doing, and then keep it in something called overdrive. Hmm. When, uh, Georgina, I'm going to per- paint a picture here for you. I'm at a stoplight. The light is red. I got my foot on the brake. The light turns green. I take my foot off the brake, and I move over to the gas pedal, and I give it gas. And I'm accelerating 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 miles an hour. What point do you feel something's abnormal? Let's just say a normal acceleration. Right now, I'm going from 0 to maybe 10 because I'm easing in on the gas so it doesn't pop out. And then it, then I have to wait until it kicks the next gear kicks in, so that I can then press it again and go to the next one. People behind me on the freeway are not happy campers. Let oh. me tell you. Oh, I bet they're not. So, especially with my road rage issues. No, I'm, I'm kidding. It's not me. <laughs> it's not me. I just would stop and give you a card, but. Uh, I, it's it's going to be hard for me to determine what you got going on. It does sound like the transmission may start be starting to get weak, but I never just jump to that gun because there's so much outside. The transmission is computer-controlled. Do we have another issue causing it not to be controlled right? So it doesn't have to be guesswork. There's no guesswork here. When somebody's truly diagnosing this thing, they're not going to say, do this or do that. They're going to say, here's the test that we've run. Here's the results that we got, and here is what the problems are. So someone can you don't have to wonder if you have the right answer if someone is truly going to do a diagnostic on it. So um, And the good thing about your issue, it sounds like it's very consistent. So someone with the proper uh, technology that can get in the vehicle with you, go on a test drive, come back and de- dispatch that out to a technician or uh, and take the proper tool should be able to give you uh, an accurate estimate of what it will take to repair the car very quickly. Well, Georgina, thanks so much for the call. And if you want to follow up with me at BumperToBumperRadio.com, there's a contact link there. Send me an email. A little tough here over the air to try and solve that for you, but uh, hopefully we can get you pointed in the right direction and find you a good shop. So thanks for the call. Let's go with Mike in Phoenix on a 2005 Nissan Titan. Go ahead, Mike. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, what a great show. I, I came up here from Stafford, Arizona to take some to the airport, and I found your show. Really Thanks. Good. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, yeah, my, my Nissan Titan I bought all oh, about a year ago from a friend of mine, and, and it's got incredible power. Don't, I mean, believe me, it's got whiplash power. I wasn't used to it when I take off. But it also has an exhaust leak, and I wonder, is that going to get worse? Is it something I, I really should go fix? Uh, you know what I mean? I, I it, it has great power. I go up the mountains. It's fine. And I bought it because I was a scout leader and family man, but 
I haven't had any troubles with it, but you can just hear, you know, as you're going along, and does it be concerned? Does it change from hot to cold? So when you start it up first thing in the morning, is it worse? And as the day, you know, as the drive goes on, it gets quieter. Hmm. Uh, I don't. I hear it all the time. I don't really know. Hadn't noticed that. Okay. It's always there. How many miles in the car? Hundred and fifty thousand. Doesn't use a drop of oil. <laughs> well, that should be relatively easy for someone to identify exactly if it's that consistent uh, whether it be an exhaust manifold gasket or there could be a gasket a converter a pipe could and quite frankly uh, with that kind of mileage it could be a hole a hole rusting through on the uh, part of the exhaust yeah for sure and it's in you know do you get it fixed is it going to get worse uh, i would identify what it is and then once once we have the facts of what it is once we can see maybe a hole in a manifold or Sometimes it's just a matter of a manifold bolt coming loose that just needs to be tightened down. So um, you live in Safford, so I don't know any great shops up in Safford, but if uh, you come down to the Valley a lot, we've got a great Nissan guy in Tempe, uh, Arizona import specialist. And, uh, you know, Matt's not here, so we'll, we'll talk about him today. They do a lot of great Nissan work up there at Virginia Auto Service at uh, 7th Street in Virginia. So finding out what's leaking is going to be important. Uh, whether you want to deal with it is going to depend on how expensive it is to fix, but fact certainly is what you want to go for. So thanks for the call, Mike. Let's go with, looks like, uh, Paul in Tempe on a 1999 Toyota 4Runner. Go ahead, Paul. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Great, thanks. Um, my 4Runner has been great, very few problems, but recently I've noticed that when I'm accelerating, it sort of stutters and uh, doesn't want to give me all its power. It seems to do it more in the morning, seems to do it at higher speeds, and um, I, I'm thinking spark plugs, maybe fuel injector, something like that. I just had the timing belt change. I don't know a whole lot about engines, so I thought I would call and get your expertise. You bet, you bet. Is it? Uh, is there any check engine lights on at all? No, not at all. Okay. Uh, Dave? It could be as simple as cleaning a mass airflow sensor. It, it could be, and, and, and I think... I think uh, the reason I would, you know, the first thing, a check engine light certainly certainly helps. That means we have a, a fingerprint in there as far as what the issue may be. But uh, it sounds like we may have a, you know, a misfire going on. And it may not be bad enough for the computer to be picking up on yet. But uh, is it stuttering when you're, when you're just maybe accelerating between 45 and 50 at that, that kind of lighter acceleration? You know, it seems to, to do it at any acceleration. Um, but I guess I just notice it more at higher, higher speeds. Okay. Well, we definitely don't want to ignore it. And the reason we don't want to ignore it, if the engine's not running right, what happens is, let's just say it's running rich. It's going to throw all that raw fuel back down to the catalytic converter and, and cause bigger issues. So you don't want to ignore a misfire. You want to get that fixed, you know, as soon as possible. But, you know, it, it could be a spark plug. It could be a broken down coil. Uh, it could be a, a lot of things going on. So it's just something someone's going to need to get in there and, and diagnose it. And, uh, you know, sometimes when we're looking at a a bad spark plug, and we, we scan and we get a code for a, a misfire on cylinder number four. Uh, some of the later model vehicles are more uh, capable of telling us where the misfire is coming from. And what we'll do is we'll clear the code, and we'll swap a couple of spark plugs, and we'll see if the misfire jumps over to the next cylinder. That's a, a quick test that a guy can do somewhat in his driveway, as long as he has a little bit of scanning ability. So thanks so much for the call. I got an email this week, Dave, and I'm trying to pull it up here, uh, that I wanted to talk about, and it's should I be scared of automotive service coupons? And uh, sometimes you should be, sometimes you shouldn't be. And this is an ongoing debate in our industry. We've got, you know, when a business is brand new and they're trying to get customers, and I'll just take a big chain brand, they're going to pump out the coupons. I mean, they're going to be coupons in every newspaper coming across the mail, and a lot of times it'll be for a serious loss leader. It'll be a $19 oil change, and that's, that's pretty cheap for an oil change when you, any more you consider it, how much money you have into it in raw costs. So when we look at that, we say that's obviously they're losing money on that deal, uh, and it is a loss leader. Does a loss leader mean I can't trust them? Well, I think you have to look at the facility, look at the offer, and look at what your intent is. Are you trying to find yourself a service at a reduced price that you're willing to take the chance? If you don't know the facility, you don't have a relationship. Competing on price is a losing proposition a lot of times for the consumer and for the repair facility. Well, and I and, and I think the the one thing that, that I hear is that, you know, I go over to this shop because we've got a relationship and they take care of my car, but their oil change is kind of expensive. So I go over to this shop and, you know, 
I take it in there, I get their $19 oil change, and they tell me this list of stuff. So some people will go to one shop for an oil change, and some people go to one shop when the car breaks. And I think when you do have a relationship uh, with the shop, I, I don't know if we're, we're saving any money. We may be saving 20 bucks on an oil change, 25 bucks on an oil change, but you know somebody else, you, want, you wouldn't go to a different pediatrician for your kid every time you take them to the doctor. You don't want the same doctor year after year, every visit. And it's kind of the same thing with a, with a automotive service. You want somebody who knows a car, has sees it on a regular basis. They have a service history to look at versus what I would call orphanage, where you're from this, this shop, this shop, that shop. And sometimes we're in a quick hurry, and we do need one of those quick lane type of situations. But uh, it shouldn't be a normal habit. That, that's very true. And you also have to understand that your vehicle is probably the second largest investment you're making besides your home. So do you really want someone doing something based on price right. and opportunity? It's kind of like fishing. Throw enough bait in the water, you're going to catch something. It's, it's like chumming. Well, there's some great shops that I do know run coupons, and it really has to do with, am I safe with the coupon? It has to do with the integrity of business. You know, the only reason that democracy works is we're a moral society. And when you've got a moral business, yeah, don't, don't be afraid to go in there with a coupon. But uh, not everybody is moral. So when we come back, we've got Doug, John, and Jap. We're taking calls at 602-277-5827. You are listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio here on this beautiful Saturday afternoon. I think we're going to be 77 degrees, and I will be riding my bike this afternoon and loving every minute of it. I am Dave Riccio, the automotive therapist, and filling in for Matt Allen, the KTR car guy, is Dave Denman from Dave's Car Care at 51st Avenue in Peoria. And we are putting you in the know when it comes to car stuff. And up for this segment, we've got, looks like, uh, John in surprise on a 2013 Chevy Sonic. And I'm not sure what a Sonic is. you know what a Sonic is, Dave? No idea. All right, John, let us know what a Sonic is. How can we help you? Uh, yeah, 2013 Sonic, brand new vehicle. Um, they're telling me that it's four-cylinder. They're telling me that it, or my wife says it runs rough. And but they they're telling me you got to run premium in it. Does the have you looked in the owner's manual to see if it asks that you run premium in that car? And usually when they require premium, right under the gas gauge, it will say premium unleaded only. Do you have either of those two things going on? Well, like I said it's my wife's car. I really haven't noticed that, but um, I never saw it. I drove it once so far. Okay. Um, in in does it hit when you drove it? Did it feel like it was running rough? No, because she had premium in it. Okay, that would be whatever the factory requires in that situation. Uh, if a car does say it requires premium, by goodness, you better go with premium gas because that's what it's di- designed for. And people say, you know, there's 89 octane. Is that what we got? 87, 89, and 92. Yeah. Uh, 87 octane gas burns quicker. The 92 octane sounds a little counterintuitive, but there's more power in 92 octane, uh, and it burns slower than an 87 octane. So when you run a lower grade of fuel, what hap- the, the car has to compensate, and it has to retard the timing just so it doesn't it doesn't uh, it doesn't ping on you. So that's what's going on there. So you want to put in whatever it goes with. Go ahead, Dave. Well, that's the key factor there of understanding the automobile that you purchase and what the factory is requiring. You know. Uh, we have a Range Rover. It's the same thing. You run the uh, lower octane fuel. You end up with poor performance, uh, and I've seen that through three or four different vehicles that I've owned. So, fo- yeah. follow the manufacturer's recommendations. And we didn't ask how many miles are on it, but uh, you know, I know with my Honda Element when I bought it, it's I think I'm almost to thirty six thousand. So I'm coming up on the end of my factory warranty, and the gas mileage has gotten better over the first thirty six thousand miles, as well as the engine runs better. So when I got it, it was kind of tight. It didn't have as much power as it does now. So a little bit of that, we don't ever use the term break in anymore, but uh, it's got to wear in and, and kind of get to its its normal operating. And I believe the program in the computer is designed to for the first you know few thousand miles to run differently than it will run. 5,000, 10,000 miles from now. So that's one thing that definitely changes as the car breaks in. So thanks so much for the call, John. Let's go with Doug in Scottsdale on a 2008 Chevrolet Tahoe. Go ahead, Doug. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, how you guys doing? Good. Good. 
uh, I have a question, and I wanted to share a little bit of information on a fix I kind of stumbled on myself. Uh, the Tahoe's got, it's a four-wheel drive. It's got about 35,000 miles, and I'm just wondering what service I need to have done now, um, you know, tranny, diff, front end, rear end, anything. Uh, this thing has only got 35,000 miles on it. It's a 2008? Yeah. So we don't drive it a whole bunch, do we? No, I'm, no, I'm fortunate that I work very close. I don't know, Dave, right off the bat. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll answer the uh, you know, the transmission question. Uh, I would say definitely service a transmission. 35,000 miles is not too soon to service a transmission. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to recommend you service it with a filter change. We remove the transmission pan. We replace the filter. I don't need know that you would need a complete fluid exchange because if you look at that fluid, it probably looks nice and cherry red. But we just want to make sure the filter is, you know, or the transmission is doing well. When we do a transmission service, we always break open the old filter we replace to see if there's any issues going on because it just gives us that nice, good feeling about it. Uh, Dave, what do you think? 35,000 miles, vehicles, five years old. Yeah, the only thing that I really think that you should pay attention to would be a fuel filter. Um, you know, basically... Uh, Belts, hoses, that type of stuff is going to be fine. Um, cabin filter, if, if one's required by the dealer, you know, being five years old. But uh, always want to change that fuel filter, in my opinion, regardless of what the manufacturer says, at least once a year. You've got electronic pumps. They get clogged. They cause that pump to work harder, and the pump is much more expensive than the filter. And I'm going to tell you the same thing as far as on that transmission service. They may not recommend that till 50,000 miles, but the one thing I tell people, we, we replace transmissions four to one over engines. You know, engines aren't failing, but transmissions are, yet we go down and get our oil changed every three months, 3,000 miles, or five months and 5,000 miles. So transmission for sure. I don't know if you said it was an all-wheel drive or four-wheel drive or not, but don't forget about your transfer case. Differentials and transfer cases, generally, as a rule of thumb, every thirty to 50,000 miles would be just fine. But I don't worry about the fluid deteriorating with age. Now, the other one that I would say would be the coolant, the Dexcool coolant that's in that vehicle. I, I would be a proponent of changing that. Some may disagree with me, but that stuff left in there too long. I think it goes sour over time. So yeah. anyway, thanks so much for the call, Doug. We are going to go with uh, John on a 2001 Volvo. Go ahead, John. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, Dave. How are you? Good. And yourself? I'm doing pretty good. I'm from North Carolina and transplant out here in Phoenix, Arizona. And my question is, I own a C70 Volvo. And who would you recommend to do the servicing on it? On a C70 Volvo, and what part of town are you in? I'm over on the west side. On the west side, well. Yeah, can you recommend anybody? Mm-hmm. Or do your, do your place of business work on a C70 Volvo? Yeah, C70, C70 Volvo is not anything special that uh, we, we can service. But if you're on the west side, you know, Dave's Car Care, 51st Avenue in Peoria, do a great job for you in any of the shops. And I would recommend you go to bumper to bumperradiocom You can hone in a little bit on what's what's closer to you. Any of the shops on there, if you give them a call, say, hey, you guys feel comfortable servicing this Volvo? They're, they're going to tell you yes or no. Now, the one thing I'm a huge proponent of is factory fill. And uh, Dave and I have this conversation from time to time. I don't like, you know, Volvo has a fluid. Hyundai has a fluid. Toyota has a fluid. Toyota has two fluids. Ford has three fluids. Everyone's got a fluid. When we service these late model transmissions, and I'm talking something beyond the year of 2000, we want to put in whatever the factory put in it versus there's a lot of companies that say, hey, we got this oil, and it works for everything. And I just don't believe it's true, and I do argue with some of my colleagues about this. <laughs> yes, you do. I do. But uh, we're, we're rebuilding transmissions on a regular basis. We're seeing what fails. And anymore on late model cars, the valve bodies are the biggest failure part in the transmission. And because they have tried to, you know, make the transmission shift as smooth as possible, they make these valves really active. So we want good fluid in there, and we want specifically the right fluid in that thing. So if, if you're earlier than 2000, it's, it's less a factor, but that's kind of some of the trade-off here for sure. So glad we could be a part of your Saturday. Hope you we lowered your automotive anxieties thanks dave for coming out to help tell us again where your shop's out and how people can get to know you uh, we're at 51st avenue in peoria on the northwest corner and dave's car care az.com and thank you dave for inviting me today i enjoyed the program well appreciate having you we had a good time eating breakfast together dave's one of my good friends so uh if you have a relationship with a shop stick with them and that's what we're going to preach on this show relationship is how to lower the anxiety 
If you don't have a great shop and you think about shopping, bumper to bumperradio.com. There's plenty of great shops on there that can take care of you all over the valley. So while you're there, like us on Facebook. Peter, thanks for putting on a great show. We'll be back next week.